So this video is all about false memory, eyewitness testimonies, and in general, why memory fails us. So we're going to be exploring these things, and before we begin, it's kind of important to establish this ground principle, which is that memory isn't perfect. In fact, it's not even that good. It's not good at all, actually. Uh, because we mostly remember the big picture item, we mostly remember the big things that happen in any event, and we don't really sweat the details. We forget a lot of these little things. And that's because memory is not like a photograph, it's not like a film, it's not like a recording, it's constantly changing. So in that way, memory is reconstructive. And the goal of this video is to basically go over some of this literature and look at the ways in which memory is reconstructive. So in order to do that, we're going to rewind back to 1974, and we're going to look at an article article by Loftus and Palmer. This is kind of a landmark study that really kind of paved the way for a lot of false memory research to begin, and I want you to kind of take note of this name, Loftus. You're going to see that name again, and if you do any kind of research in this field, you'll come across this name over and over. So here are the instructions to this task. What I'm going to ask you to do is to just watch this 30-second video. Try to remember everything that you can about it, and afterwards, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So get ready. And also, there's no tricks behind this. There's no reverse psychology, and there's no moonwalking bears, uh, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about there. Uh, and just as a warning, you're about to witness a car crash. It's just test dummies and nobody's going to get hurt. So here we go. Okay, so according to Loftus and Palmer, your memory for the video clip is not set in stone. It can and it will change. In other words, the things that you experience in this video may influence your memory after the car accident. So pay attention. What I may say and what I may show you is going to influence your memory for what you just saw. So I'm going to distract you with another task. So here are the instructions. I'm going to read you 15 words. Try to remember them to the best of your abilities. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to give you a few words, and I want you to tell me if you recognize them from this initial list or not. Okay, so here we go. Get ready. Three, two, one. Bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. So that was pretty easy, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off five words, and you just tell me if you recognize that word from the list of 15. All you have to do is say yes or no. So do you recognize the word bed? Nightmare, salsa, snore, sleep. All right, pencils down. Let me check your answers. Let's see what we got here. So did you recognize the word bed? Yes, the word bed was in the list. What about nightmare? No. What about salsa? Nope. What about snore? Yes. What about sleep? No. Wait, wait, wait. What a second. Sleep wasn't in that list? Are you sure? You can go back and rewind it if you want to, but sleep wasn't in the list. Here's the list of words that I read aloud. Sleep wasn't in that list of words. But it sure feels like it was, right? All these words are related to sleep. So to explain why this happens, we need to talk about the spreading activation theory of long-term memory. Basically, the idea is that whenever you activate one memory, you're going to activate memories around that. So in this case, we activated sleep, but on accident. So we have all of these other words that are related that are close by sleep. We also have nightmare, insomnia, salsa, which are a little bit further away. They're a little bit less related to the word sleep. So whenever I said the word bed, it activated some of the memories that are next to the word bed. And whenever I said the word rest, it activated some of the memories near the word rest. And the same for awake, the same for dream, the same for snooze. You get the idea. When we, whenever I said those words aloud, it activated nearby memories for that. It did not activate nightmare, insomnia, or salsa, which were a little bit farther away. And you'll see sleep right here seems like it's activated, right? Because all of these nearby uh, words are kind of helping activate by spreading that activation to sleep. 
So bed in this case would be a studied word, salsa an unrelated lore, nightmare a related lore, and sleep a critical lore, according to uh, some of the studies that, that talk about this kind of thing. So uh, this was kind of a replication of Rodinger and McDermott uh, from 1995, uh, but this research goes back even farther than that. You can see they mentioned John Deese in his 1959 study right here, and it's because of that that we now call this the Deese-Rodinger-McDermott paradigm. So when we're people talking about the DRM paradigm, they're talking about how we remember lists of information and how we often get it wrong. And the reason all this happens is because of suggestion you're much less likely to say the word sleep on your own if I were to ask you to recall that entire list. But it does sound familiar whenever someone says it back to us. So here's a neural explanation for why this happens. We're going to zoom in on two key areas, the hippocampus and the parahippocampus. We're going to start with the hippocampus right here. And what you can see based on this graph using fMRI data is that the hippocampus treats memories true or false as the same. It doesn't matter if that memory actually happened or not. The critical lure, in that case sleep, is not treated as a new event. Event. But if we look at the parahippocampus, we see that the parahippocampus treats false memories as new. So the critical lure, like sleep, is treated as a new event, and true memories show the greatest activation. So it's basically like the hippocampus doesn't recognize this as a false memory, but the parahippocampus does. The differences between these two areas is part of the reason why we get a weird feeling when we have deja vu. A new memory is treated like an old one. But I know what you're thinking. How does this relate to the real world? So far, we're just talking about lists of words. Real life is much more complicated than just lists. So the deese rodiger mcdermott paradigm is all good, but where does the real world enter the equation? And this brings us back to Elizabeth Loftus, who you may remember from the very beginning of this video. She is one of the foremost researchers in this area. She's been doing this stuff a lot and gotten under a lot of scrutiny in the 90s for basically saying that repressed memories are not really all that accurate. Uh, so back in the 90s, she also had another study called the Formation of False Memories, but we kind of know it by another name today, which is the Lost in the Mall study. And it's called that for a very good reason. In the study, Loftus and her colleague Pickerel basically convinced people that they were lost in the mall as a very young child. The way that it worked was this. You have somebody come in for a typical psychology experiment and you let them know that you've contacted their parents to get some information about some of the childhood events because what you are interested in is kind of memory for childhood, but that's actually not what you're interested in as the researcher. In fact, you're just interested in false memories. And so the way this goes is that you're gonna ask them a couple of questions about, um, a about this time you were lost in the mall. Now, chances are you were probably never lost in the mall as a kid, but the questions kind of suggest that you are. And so they will ask you things like, do you remember when you were lost in the mall? Do you remember how long it was that you were lost in the mall? Do you remember whenever a, a man with a plaid shirt uh, came up to you and he was in his 50s and he had gray hair and he asked you, you know, if there was any way that you were lost and he helped you get to the service desk to let you know, uh, let your parents know that you're going to be okay and that you're going to be found. And what happened is that about a quarter of participants actually said that they remembered this. Um, and I know 25% doesn't sound like that much, but it's actually a crazy large amount whenever you consider that none of this actually ever happened. And this just shows that the power of suggestion and the power of language can actually influence our memory for things that didn't actually happen. And talking about Loftus' work brings us right back to the beginning of our video when we watched the car crash video. So try to answer the following questions. What color was the first car? Which seat was the dummy riding in? How fast were the cars going when they smashed into one another? The one that we're most interested in though is gonna be this question right here. How fast were they going when they smashed into one another? When Loftus and Palmer use words like bumped or hit, what they found is that people remembered slower speeds less than 45 miles an hour, but when they used words like smashed or collided, people seem to remember faster speeds, so greater than 45 miles an hour. Now, what we all saw, those cars were going 45 miles an hour, but depending on the language we use, that can actually influence the way we remember these events. Now, if you're looking for a take-home message, maybe it's this. Our memories aren't perfect. Context and language can change how we remember real-world events. So, be skeptical about memory. Not just mine, not just yours, but everybody's. That's all that we have time for. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.